Emerson Mnangagwa is sworn in as Zimbabwe's second president since 1980. A CNN report about African migrants being sold as slaves sparks international outrage and puts pressure on Libya's UN-backed government. And in our Music Maker segment, Malian Roots meets rock and roll. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. First to Southern Africa, Emerson Mnangagwa became Zimbabwe's first new president in decades on Friday before a capacity crowd at the National Sports Stadium in Harare. Mnangagwa, who was fired November 5th from his position as Zimbabwe's vice president, was years of authoritarian rule by Robert Mugabe. Taking his oath of office, the 75-year-old, known as the Crocodile, vowed to uphold the constitution of the former British colony and project, protect the rights of all Zimbabweans, 16 million citizens of them. In a speech, he said, and acknowledged there had been errors. I will devote myself to the well-being of Zimbabwe and its people. So help me God. What this day means for Zimbabweans, uh, Deo Mavinga, director of Southern Africa Human Rights Watch, joins us via Skype from Johannesburg. And here in studio, Blessing Zulu, VOA's Zimbabwe service reporter. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Vincent. Yes, and we wanted to start with uh, Dewa in Johannesburg. Uh, Dewa, I don't know if you have you on the line. Yes, uh, first uh, let's start by asking you what has been your uh, kind of observation so far. The president has been sworn in. Uh, talk a little bit about what stood out in his uh, speech. Okay, it looks like there's a little delay. So here was uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, now as president, says he's committing himself to. What else stood out in that speech that makes people, you know, makes you think, well, this is something different. This is a new day, new dawn. Uh, in his speech, he was uh, hitting uh, the right notes in as far as. Uh, uh, bringing all the parties together. Remember, uh, it's not only uh, with the opposition, uh, his ruling ZANU-PF party uh, and the opposition, but also internal fights within the ruling ZANU-PF um, itself. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Mugabe had uh, presided over the nation for 37 years. Uh, give him credit for some of the things that he did as the uh, founding leader of so uh, some omissions, uh, but um, as he left, you know, the country was uh, divided along uh, lines, uh, factional lines in the uh, party. So uh, by uh, calling upon all Zimbabweans to unite and uh, work together, I think that was uh, very, very significant. How about uh, the fact that he actually said there had been errors during Mugabe's rule, but we know that you cannot separate him from Mugabe. In, 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 that's very true because uh, in, in that uh, speech he said Mugabe uh, is his mentor, uh, Mugabe is his father. So he was uh, very much a part of this uh, system. Remember, uh, he worked uh, with uh, Mr. Mugabe since 1976, first as his uh, personal bodyguard, and then later in Mr. Mugabe's uh, cabinet, responsible mostly for uh, security ministries. So I think he's very much a part of the. Uh, Mugabe regime. Yes. Now, I don't know if we have uh, Dewa on the line now from uh, Johannesburg. Dewa Mavinga, are you there? Dewa, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Dewa looks like he's trying to organize himself. You can't hear us, but uh, as we continue here, uh, 
there was also the other aspect of reconciling, you know, the Zimbabweans so that he can uh, have a nation that is united. But we've also had reports of, mm -hmm. of uh, some officials being tortured. For example, Minister of Finance Ignatius uh, uh, Chombo. Chombo. Mm -hmm. uh, how credible are those stories and what can that kind of situation uh, kind of lead to, especially at this very critical time? Mm -hmm. Uh, shortly be before coming on air, like 10 minutes ago, I spoke to uh, Dr. Chumbo's lawyer, Professor Love Momaduku, uh, and uh, he was uh, confirming uh, those reports that uh, uh, Dr. Chumbo was uh, blindfolded for a week. Uh, he was tortured by the military, and uh, last night he was handed over to the police. Now he is in hospital under police detention and is expected to appear in court tomorrow. What were his crimes? Uh, of course, remember when the military moved in, they said they want to um, uh, remove what they called the criminal elements uh, around Mr. Mugabe. So he was one of those, uh, including, of course, uh, the higher education minister, Professor Jonathan Moyo, and uh, local government minister, uh, Sevia Kasukwere. Those two uh, were lucky to escape because they rushed to Mr. Mugabe's uh, private residence, the so-called Blue Roof. Uh, mm -hmm. in Harare. So when uh, the uh, military was negotiating uh, the, uh, with President Robert Mugabe to step yeah. down, I think one of the requests by Mr. Mugabe was for Moyo and Kasukwere to be allowed to leave the country. So they were lucky. But uh, uh, of course, human rights lawyers are saying that there are quite a number of people who are in detention. I managed to talk to um, Mr. Mugabe's nephew, Patrick Joao. He was uh, the Minister of uh, Labor, and he was telling me that he, he had heard that over 100 people had been mm -hmm. detained, and he was uh, talking about uh, some people having been killed, but uh, we cannot uh, independently uh, confirm that. Yes. Uh, so now, I don't know if we have Dewa. Uh, he's been trying to kind of uh, uh, join us from Johannesburg. Uh, Dewa Mavinga, do we have you? Okay, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you. Okay, now let's get your thoughts first about uh, today's uh, inauguration of um, Mr. Munangagwa, but also those reports of uh, people being tortured, people uh, having been detained, of course, by the military, and what uh, Mr. Munangagwa can do to change uh, the image of Zimbabwe going forward. Well, clearly, uh, Mr. Munangagwa's uh, speech... Uh, at his inauguration was focused on the international community, on investments, on uh, business, on the economy, but not so much on reforms, on human rights, and certainly nothing at all on the people who were arrested uh, by the military, detained, beaten up, and tortured between November 14 uh, and uh, today. Uh, human rights, what we have spoken to, uh, a number of these individuals, uh, their families, uh, their homes are under mil military siege, as we speak. Uh, a number of them are in hiding. Uh, armed soldiers are still going to their homes, ransacking, destroying property, uh, destroying vehicles, uh, beating up people, torturing people, uh, allegedly to find information. Uh, but uh, Mr. Mnangagwa has not directly addressed these issues. It shows clearly that uh, this is a continuation of military rule uh, with Mnangagwa now as leader. And uh, he has said uh, next year there will be elections as, as scheduled, but, but that is really worrisome because but, but, we but, see that there is no change. But very quickly, I mean, we can say he just became president. Perhaps we can judge him from tomorrow onwards, right? Well, but, but he, he is fully aware of uh, the military uh, positions and what the military has been doing. Because he said when he was out of the country, he kept in close contact. And he's aware that there are people who have picked up a number of people from the other security forces branches, like the Central Intelligence Organization, the CIO. A number of those people were thought to be loyal to Mugabe and were handed down, uh, locked up, beaten up, and tortured to uh, disclose what plans were there, uh, what were the sources of, of financing for the G40 faction, and things like that. And Munanga was fully briefed, but he, he pretends to the world that perhaps he does not know what's happening. And that is worrisome because for a fresh start, to make a clean break with um, Mugabe's legacy, there is need for Mnangagwa to open up. And also you could tell from his speech that he has no intention really uh, to embracing the opposition or to have some kind of coalition mm. government. So yeah. we are uh, really business as usual. It's not 
a fresh start for Zimbabwe. Wow, well, we'll be watching very closely to see how things move on. I want to thank you very much, uh, uh, Dewa, and blessing for thank joining so much, us today Princess. and giving us those insights. Well, that's um, Dewa Mavinga, his director of South and Africa Human Rights Watch, and blessing Zulu, his uh, Zimbabwe view. Now, the swearing in of President Emerson Mnangagwa on Friday signals the definitive end to the 37 year rule of Robert Mugabe. Now, Zimbabweans want to make sure they get to elect their next leader and to pick a leader who won't shove aside their problems and concerns. Viewers Anita Powell has our report from Harare. With the end of the Mugabe era, Zimbabweans are excited and hungry for change. Today, we are witnessing the beginning of a new unfolding democracy. In the capital, which leans toward the opposition, the resignation has brought new life to voter registration drives. The opposition MDC Tea Party's director of elections says an impressive 60,000 people have registered in Harare in the past. They resigned. There was an upset. People seem to eat that it cannot be the military, it cannot be a single, in, some few individuals who can actually bring it and a credible president. Most Zimbabweans, it seems, have strong feelings about the man who led Zimbabwe for 30 years. Emerson Managagwa, locally known as ED, rose to power last week when the military detained Mugabe. People love Robert Mugabe. <laughs> and they don't wish anything bad for him. When I look at Mugabe, I put Mugabe in the same category with him. Saddam Hussein. Mama Gaddafi of Libya. Munosevic. Shop owner George Gaga blames his struggling business on the shattered economy. And he blames that on Mugabe. In fact, during the Mugabe years, there was one thing he refused to sell. You can't say it of a dictator, someone who was used to, to cool people. On Harare's bustling streets, however, everyone seems to agree on one thing. Elections should happen on time. The Zimbabwean constitution says elections are there between 22 July to 22 August. We believe that must be maintained. It's important to follow the constitution in the prescribed time as it states. So we must go for election. Most voters made simple demands of their new government. I want a government that listens to its people. That is what that is the type of government. The government that can hear its people, the government that, that can address uh, its people. Zimbabweans, he wants that change to come from the ballot, not the bullet. Anita Powell, VOA News, Harare, Zimbabwe. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, the Libyan government says it is investigating slave trade reports. Stay with us. My name is Carla Babb and I work the Pentagon Beat. That access helps me to do better stories. Every day it's my responsibility to collect all of the defense news. It keeps our VOA viewers informed. I get to travel all across the globe. Anything that's defense related and how to protect and keep people safe, that's where I'll go. So it's never a dull moment at the Pentagon. My name is Carla Babb. This is my Beat. Well, militants killed at least 235 people at a mosque in Egypt's North Sinai region on Friday when they detonated a bomb and shot at fleeing worshippers and ambulances. That's according to state media and the official news agency MENA. Another 125 people were wounded. It was one of the deadliest attacks in the region's Islamist insurgency. 
An Oak Group uh, claimed immediate responsibility, but since 2014, Egyptian security forces have battled a stubborn Islamic State affiliate in the north of Sinai, where militants have killed hundreds of police and soldiers. Uh, the government declared three days of mourning. In North Africa, three United Nations peacekeepers and one Malian soldier were killed and several others wounded on Friday in an attack by an unidentified assailant in northeastern Mali. The UN mission in Mali said in a statement uh, that the soldiers came under fire during a joint operation in the Menaka region near Mali's border with Niger, where raids by jihadist groups um, with links to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State have spiked over the last year. Now, the mission did not specify the nationalities of the peacekeepers. Libyan officials say they have launched an investigation into a CNN television report that claimed African migrants are being sold as slaves in that country. The CNN report has sparked outrage in Africa as well as in Europe. Here is more with viewers Zlatica Hok. Migrants are caged at Tripoli Detention Center as they await repatriation or herded at the Tripoli Navy base after being rescued from the Mediterranean Sea. These images and recent reports that migrants are being auctioned off as slaves have forced the Libyan government to respond. There have been direct instructions issued by the government to form an investigative committee to reach the truth and to capture the criminals and those responsible and put them before the judiciary. As conditions for migrants worsen, many want to return home. A man who returned from Libya to Ivory Coast Wednesday night confirmed reports of a slave trade. As soon as you arrive in Libya, the first thing happening is that you are taken away and you are sold. Our black brothers from West Africa, wherever you are from, a Malian, a Senegalese, or any other nationality from the West, even an Ivorian, you are sold for what? For about 1,000 dinars. Reports of slave markets in Libya have sparked outrage. French President Emmanuel Macron has demanded United Nations Security Council action aimed at dismantling the smugglers' networks. He has also called on regional governments to help Libya bear the burden of migrants. There is presently no stable government in Libya. We're working actively in the framework of the United Nations mediation so that there can be a durable political solution. But in the meantime, Libya cannot handle such a migratory pressure. The chair of African Union Commission has appealed to member nations for help. I appeal to all the member states of the African Union, to the African private sector and to the African citizens to make financial contributions to help alleviate the suffering of these African migrants in Libya. I urge member states that have the logistical means to facilitate the evacuation of these migrants from Libya who wish to be evacuated. Many Africans blame their governments for driving young people to exodus. Since independence in the 60s up until today, young Africans prefer risking drowning and going through terrible conditions and go to countries that can ruin their lives in order to escape the terrible conditions they they live in. We should all be concerned about what's going on in our countries. Our leaders should feel ashamed by what's happening. We held rallies in Paris, but we should be holding rallies here too. The International Organization for Migration says close to 9,000 stranded migrants have been returned home this year, only to be replaced by countless others. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, South Africa's Supreme Court has increased Oscar Pistorius' murder sentence to 13 years and five months after the state argued the original punishment for killing his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, was shockingly lenient. The athlete was jailed in July last year after being found guilty on an appeal of murdering model and law graduate Steenkamp on Valentine's Day 2013 by firing four shots through a locked bathroom door. He had originally been found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to five years in jail. That conviction was increased to murder by the Supreme Court in December 2015, and his sentence extended to six years by trial judge Tokozile Masipa in July last year. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, Malian Roots, music meets rock and roll. 
We'll be right back. Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. The sales of the Black Friday in the United States may not excite retailers as it used to. as according to a survey released by PricewaterhouseCoopers. The survey suggests that only 35% of the consumers who plan to shop during the week of Thanksgiving say they will do so on the Black Friday. The figure was 51% at that of last year. Months of preparations and strategy have been invested to ensure stores take as much of the retail pie as possible. Still, hope springs eternal and lines of shoppers across the country brave the cold to snap up the best deals. Well, next up, just in time for the holidays, a new miniature robot from Japanese automaker Toyota Motor Corp has gone on sale at Toyota's showrooms. Kirobo Mini is a simplified and smaller version of the Kirobo robot. A talking humanoid designed by uh, Tomo, uh, Tomokat, Tomotaka Takahashi, which went into space in 2013. At 10 centimeters when seated, Kirobo Mini fits on a person's palm. It is designed to be a mascot like companion, raising both its arms in a greeting uh, when in, uh, it detects an approaching smiling face. The $390 robot supposedly has the intelligence of a five year old. Well, and finally, an Alabama police dog has become an internet sensation after a video was posted of him doing push-ups with two officers. Now, the video is also intended as a public safety reminder. Uh, Nitro is a two-year-old Dash Shepherd who joined the Gulf Shores uh, Police Department's uh, canine unit in February. Now, the seven-second video is part of a social media trend, hashtag 9 p.m. routine reminding people to remove valuables from cars and lock up at the end of the day. Wow. And that is what is training. I should do more push-ups myself. But Doug can do it. <laughs> Welcome back, it's Music Maker, and today we introduce BKO Quintet. This is a Marlin Ro a Roots a Rock and Roll band. The title of their song is Tangwanana. Now, to tell us more about the group and their style, I'm joined by Music Time host, uh, Music Time in Africa host, Heather Maxwell. Welcome. It's been a while, huh? Thank you, yeah. Yes. It's nice to be here. Now, did I nice murder that? Uh, the the no, title Tangwana. of Tangwana. Tangwana. Yeah. Tangwana, yeah? Yeah. Any idea what that is all about? It's a song that is a, uh, praising Soma, which yeah. is a Bambara word for healers, sorcerers, yeah. uh, and basically mystic people. Yeah. So uh, talking about uh, Bambara and Mali, we can expect that it, it's heavy still on the Malian traditional instruments, right? Yeah, Vincent, what's so exciting about this song, this video, and the whole new album that the band has come out with just recently is that it combines two really deep traditional forms of music in Mali. Mm -hmm. One is the hunter's music. It's music associated with the hunter's fraternity. Mm -hmm. And the other is griot music. Yeah. And you see that in this music video. The uh, round instrument is yeah. the instrument that's generally played by the hunters. And the string instrument this way is the one that's played by griots. Normally, they don't mix. Let's watch this mix in yeah. this song, Tangwana. <laughs> All right. There we go. You want me to make a 
a lovely piece there indeed an amazing marriage of those two types of uh, styles of music yes. and the rock and roll comes out because they've electrified the instruments and yeah. they added the drum set mm -hmm. and, and is this an old group uh, this is their second album so no not really they've been together old. I think five <coughs> six Excuse years yeah. yeah yeah you know we want to listen to more of this because yeah. I think I like it so much so I really have to thank you for coming and kind of shedding some more light on this. My pleasure. And so uh, Heather Maxwell, uh, of course, uh, to learn more about Heather Maxwell, um, you can go to <coughs> her VOA radio show, visit Facebook and type in the keywords, <coughs> excuse me, music time in Africa. <coughs> Let's play the music. You want me to take over for you? <coughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> <coughs> Welcome to English in a Minute. Today's episode won't cost you anything. Freebie. Let's see what this one is about. Anna, I love my job. Oh yeah? Why is that? I get so many freebies from the bands I write about. CDs, t-shirts, water bottles, even tickets to see them perform. Wow. The only freebie I ever got from my job was this bottle of spray cleaner. 